thanks to all of the folks at Patton who have made this conference possible. Um, I am really honored today to be pre presenting with my colleague and friend, Sharon Dunn, who is the former principal at Loudoun Elementary School in California, where Sharon and I had a chance to work together and uh, we have been friends and uh, colleagues ever since. So we're gonna be sharing a little bit about our experiences working together and really highlighting the work that Sharon did as principal of a very challenging elementary school and the way that she used the MTSS model as the framework for implementing the science of reading, as we now call it. And she's gonna be highlighting the way that she herself as a principal learned about structured literacy, explicit and systematic reading instruction, assessment, professional development, teaming, problem solving, all of the components of MTSS. So you're gonna to get to hear uh, real world examples from both of us about how to lead the work of improving reading outcomes, particularly in that important role as a building principal. So just imagine, can you imagine what it would be like in our schools if most of our students were proficient readers? Just think about that. Think about it across the United States. I'd like to share with you, because I know what it was like at my school when we fixed the reading problem, when we were on our, the road to fixing the reading problem, and we were able to create accurate, fluent readers who read with comprehension. They became engaged, confident, and they wanted to learn. Behaviors improved. And the overall feel of the school was so positive because powerful and productive learning was going on on a daily basis. So next, Stephanie, the imagine what would the ripple effect be in our community, our communities, our county, our state, across the United States? What if the school to prison pipeline were diminished due to the increased reading proficiency of our students? Ensuring that students read with accuracy, fluency, and comprehension is the most fundamental responsibility as school principals and educational leaders. Reading proficiency is the ultimate equity outcome the ability to read proficiently with understanding provides students with the access to opportunity for life. I can't think of any larger goal to accomplish in life. Next, I'd like to share with you how we began at my school. And it was really with the kindergarten data. It was so profound to me. When we were able to finally get some accurate data in, we found in our first year that at the beginning of the year, 35% of our students came to us from their homes. Some had preschool, some didn't. But by the end of the year, do you see what happened? It went, our scores went down on track for being proficient readers. And we had dedicated and wonderful teachers that loved their students. They worked hard, but our Student population was changing. Our neighborhoods were changing. We were clearly, we were not meeting the needs of our students. But when we brought in the accurate data, we learned and equipped ourselves with the science of reading and we changed our instruction. In four years, we were able to end the year with 90% of our kindergarten students uh, on track for reading. And at the beginning of the year it changed too because by then, TK was implemented in our school system and we knew enough about the essential components of reading that we shored up our TK students with that all important phonemic awareness. And honestly, our kindergarten teachers, they didn't waste any time from day one. They started teaching with all the essential uh, components. And so the beginning of the year score raised as well, but that 90%, what was profound. So right away, I want to share with you um, the CAS scores in California. We take the S back. And just to give you a frame of reference, 
that our school was, we had 840 students, 88% poverty um, or low socioeconomic and 70% Hispanic, 28% EL, and 14% African American. And we went from the first year, if you can read this graph, I, I love this analysis because the dark blue in 2015, that's where we started. And it was overall grades three through six was just barely 21% of students met or exceeded the standards. But in four short years, implementing what we knew, changing our systems, supporting our instructional practices, we grew to have an outcome of nearly 60% of our students reaching proficiency. This was profound. The end of the year state test is one of the strongest indicators to show if we've truly um, fixed our reading problems. When students can accurately read with comprehension, it frees up the brain space. Uh, they become skilled readers who increasingly and strategically understand vocabulary, language stru structures, their verbal reasoning improves in background knowledge and literacy knowledge. It highlights the student's ability to integrate the skills across multiple standards which is a key component to college and career readiness. When the right data began to drive the instruction at our school, we, it literally changed everything in improving reading outcomes. And it was that right data that led us to the ultimate outcome of the end of the year assessment. Go ahead, Stephanie. And it all begins with our beliefs, you know, just think of your school's mission and district statement. I know that that statement must have something to do with this next statement on the beliefs. That you believe that it's the purpose of your school to ensure that all students learn at high levels. This is fundamental and we believe it wholeheartedly and that's what we want to do. But I beg the question, do we really have the supports and the processes to make that happen? Go ahead. Because it's all about our response, our response to instruction. I love this quote from Larry Lazote. He says, high expectations for success will be judged not only by the initial staff's beliefs and behaviors, but also by the organization's response when some students don't learn. And I had a lot of students not learning and we had to respond to that. It was our job. Go ahead. And our beliefs enough. It's good, but it's not enough. It's truly about matching the instruction to the needs of the students. And do we truly acknowledge that students learn at different rates and with different levels of support? Have we created a schedule that guarantees students will receive additional opportunities for learning in a systematic way, regardless of who their teacher might be? I can remember talking with my staff and having that conversation early on in our journey. And I said, I have five grandchildren. I'd like to be able to bring them to Loudoun and put them in any one of your classes. And the goal is to ensure that each one of them will learn at high levels, that there will be equitable instruction. But they all just looked at each other. They knew there were such varying differences in the way each teacher taught at each grade level. We couldn't guarantee that outcome. Next. Our school had a lot of training in PLC with Rick DeFore, our district. And I love what he said. He says successful academic outcomes are not achieved by waiting for students to fail. We have to avoid that at all costs, as you know. But instead, it's achieved by systematically applying these two questions to our work. And the two main questions for us were, how will we know if students learned? And 
How will we respond if they don't learn? But when we began to really understand that we had to fix the reading problem, we had a clarity of focus. We couldn't fix everything. We had to start with, let's create proficient readers. That was the clarity. So we took the questions and we said, how will we know if students learned and became proficient readers? And how will we respond if they aren't proficiently reading? That was our goal. So Sharon and I um, share a value in basing instructional practices in reading research. We see that as a foundation and a real advantage when there's a knowledge base that already exists that we can bring to bear to address the challenges that we face in schools. We think we should be using that. So we're, we're talking about that research base now as the science of reading. And we envision that as a, a, a lifeline that we're throwing out to students, but it's not just about adopting different practices. It's certainly not about just adopting or swapping out programs. There's a delivery system for contextualizing that research to fit with the needs of your system. So we think about MTSS, multi-tiered systems of support, as that delivery mechanism. So it's what's going to uh, deliver the interventions and the research to your specific school system. And we like to use the definition of the science of reading from the Reading League. This gives us a nice framework and understanding that the science of reading is not a single study, uh, that it's a vast interdisciplinary body of scientifically based research. So research that can really inform choices about what and how to teach in schools, that this research base is still and ever evolving, but there's a long history that we can draw from. And it includes, I think most importantly, the way that we match assessment information, what we know about students, to the actions and frameworks that we put in place in schools for the purposes of prevention and intervention. And some people aren't aware that multi-tiered systems of support or MTSS is actually part of the definition of the science of reading. In the Reading League's defining guide document, you'll find this page that very clearly articulates the framework for implementing what's in the reading research. So multi-tiered systems of support is that delivery mechanism, that way that educators contextualize the needs of students within the reading research and do that nice match between what students need and the instructional delivery systems, that tiered model of intervention and instruction that we build based on what students need so that we are using the lowest intensity resources to get the maximum benefit for our students. And that every student, students with lower skills, students with higher skills, every student on that continuum gets what they need through regular classroom reading instruction first and foremost, that's tier one. And as students indicate that they need something additional, that we have systems in place to deliver that uh, secondary prevention of reading failure system or tier two. And for the students who have the most intensive needs, the tier three system of uh, very intensive supports. And as Sharon said, that students don't have to wait to fail. We are able to provide even intensive supports to students from the very beginning of kindergarten. So for us, there are some core components that sit at the base of that tiered model of instruction. And that includes uh, not just engineering a system of tiered instruction and intervention, but having a school-wide assessment system, having teams that meet to do problem solving. So using the data in a structured decision-making process and having ongoing professional learning and coaching. These are at the base of that tiered model. And we're gonna talk about, and Sharon's gonna give examples of putting each of those things in place for the benefit of your students. But I'm gonna start with 
some common misunderstandings around each of those core components. First of all, in terms of thinking about a three-tiered model, the part that most people think about when they think MTSS. One of the common misunderstandings that I experience is that people will say that their triangle is upside down. And I think what this conveys is a misunderstanding that the tiers are about students and not about instruction, systems of instruction. When people say their triangle is upside down, I think that means they're saying that they have more students who are at risk than they have students who are on track. And to me, that is a misunderstanding of the model because the tiers are about instructional systems, not about students. So we don't have tier one students. We don't have red, yellow, and green students. We have tier one, tier two, and tier three instructional systems. The misunderstanding that I find to be most common around assessment is the confusion between universal screening and diagnostic assessments. And we're gonna go into this a little bit more deeply, but uh, these are two assessment purposes for which you will need to choose two different tools. You can't use a diagnostic assessment for screening and you can't use screening to answer diagnostic questions about exactly what to teach next. The third component related to teaming leadership and collaborative problem solving, uh, the most common misunderstanding that I hear here is people will say, yeah, MTSS sounds great. It's, it's an ideal kind of situation. We don't have that situation at my school. What you're describing as MTSS won't work in my school. I hear this very often, and I think it conveys a lack of understanding that making it work in your school is exactly the work of MTSS. It is exactly identifying the barriers to student learning and systematically using your resources to resolve those barriers. It's not gonna look the same in every school within a district. It's not gonna look the same district to district. What is common across all is using student assessment data in the problem solving model to remove barriers and get systems in place for all students to be successful. And obviously this takes professional learning and coaching. And one of the common misunderstandings here is that this, this MTSS is something that you do or the science of reading or even structured literacy is a thing that you do. And we did that last year, so we don't need to do that again this year. Uh, when it comes to MTSS, this is ongoing planning and problem solving. It's not a one and done kind of endeavor. So here's a very basic definition that Sharon and I use to convey the fact that MTSS is more than just moving students between tiers. It is a school-wide improvement framework, and it is essentially about the systematic use of data in problem solving. Some real uh, Keys to focus on for us include finding out what students need. So this is the assessment component to MTSS. It's driven by student needs. It's designed based on student needs. Every decision related to multi-tiered systems of support starts with and is grounded in student needs. So finding out what they need is first. The part that many uh, folks forget about or don't emphasize enough is the first step to building a multi-tiered system of support. And the most important step is to provide what students need in the regular classroom reading instruction, what we call tier one within MTSS. I, I find many schools are doing universal screening. They're finding out which students are at risk, finding out what students need, but then they are going straight to intervention. If a student is at risk, they get intervention. And that means you're skipping over the place where students spend most of their reading instructional minutes, which is the regular classroom, tier one. So a real shift uh, for some folks might be this second step of giving students what they need in tier one, actually designing tier one to function as prevention of reading failure. 
to support tier one so that it reduces risk and minimizes the number of students who need intervention. Making sure that tier one is targeted and focused at exactly what students in each grade level need. And then recognizing that some students are going to need more. They're going to need better. They're going to need more intensive supports, extra support at tier two and or tier three. All students can be successful readers, but not with the same kind or amount of instruction. So that's what that image of the tiered model is conveying that some students will need additional instructional opportunities or additional doses, tiers of instruction and intervention to meet those grade level expectations. The most important data uh, point that I think schools collect around uh, improving reading performance is the percentage of students who are on track, the percentage of students who are at risk, this aggregation of the data at a grade level. This is the very important piece of information. Yes, we're concerned about individual students who are at risk, but we can't approach changing reading outcomes one student at a time. We have to take this systems perspective. And if we have a large proportion, like 66% of our students who are at risk, we have a reading crisis. And we will not be able to solve that crisis uh, one student at a time or just through intervention. So we really like to rely, oh, I shouldn't have talked over that. I'm gonna do it again. We really like to rely on Anita Archer's quote uh, that the magic is in the instruction. First and foremost, the most important piece of the multi-tiered systems of support model is to focus on instruction. So this is where uh, we get into the nitty gritty, right? Because this is where we might have some, uh, some conflicts, some different beliefs, some old ways of practicing, some ideas that might hold us back from working differently, uh, some limitations in terms of understanding what's in the research, uh, some ways of practicing in the past uh, this is the way we've always done it. If we're putting kids in, in guided reading groups, that feels like differentiation. Uh, these are all the old practices and beliefs that can stand in our way when we are trying to improve reading outcomes. These are the things that we need to surface, the reality that we need to uncover and uh, and face, honestly, so that we can work through it. As Sharon said, all of the teachers in her school were working hard. They were all doing their best, uh, but they needed support to learn something new and to do something different. So moving in the direction of the science of reading is consistent with what you'll hear from the International Dyslexia Association as structured literacy. This is a way of thinking about and informing not only what to teach, which includes those structures of language that underlie literacy, but also how to teach. Uh, again, relying on what's in the research about instruction being explicit, systematic, cumulative, and diagnostic. This can really ground and frame the work that we're doing towards improving reading outcomes. So we like to simplify things and think about a short list of why students aren't getting instruction that's matched to their needs, primarily in tier one. And as I said, this can come from a lack of knowledge. Uh, teachers have not necessarily been supported to learn about the science of reading in their teacher preparation programs or in their district in service. So this is a, an important next step. Uh, Sharon's going to talk a lot about how the schedule supports change in reading outcomes in schools. This is a key component. Having the right personnel, but also repurposing the personnel that you have is really important to making this change. And using not just screening data, but also diagnostic data to inform the work you're doing with students. So, uh, we wish it was exactly this easy, but uh, we're gonna say problem solved at least in some of the places that Sharon and I have worked. 
So I'm going to let Sharon talk a little bit more about her journey. Yeah. Yeah, it is a solvable problem for sure. But if you were like me, you know, I, I was facing insurmountable odds. It seemed like we couldn't do enough to get on track with, with preventing reading failure. And you don't know what you don't know. But I have to ask this question um, of school principals and district administrators. Do you know exactly how many students and which students at each grade level are reading accurately, fluently, and with comprehension? If not, why not? We need to know this without a shadow of a doubt. And this is precisely where you wanna begin. It's with the right kind of assessments that will help answer these questions and drive your instruction to the best practices to improve reading, reading outcomes. This slide represents CASP data. I showed you the, the CASP, CASP data previously, but this was our first year. This was like the seminal moment. And um, you can see, look at fourth grade, 12% met or exceeded standards. And I had such great fourth grade teacher. I had, it, it just was really hard to see this. And I had to go to an administrator's meeting and the new data came out and was rank ordered. And where do you think our school was? It was at the very bottom out of 24 schools. So it um, clearly was a call for us. We, we didn't have any time to waste. It was unacceptable and we had to change our practices. And we had far too many reading assessments to choose from. It was, you know, there's the curriculum assessments, there's common formative assessments, there's adaptive reading assessments, standard-based assessments. Okay, fine, well, and good, but they didn't really give us the right information or enough information about how to fix the reading problem. They just, they weren't adequate. We not only needed the right assessments to, to really uh, measure the essential literacy skills to improve reading, but we had to equip ourselves with um, the understanding of research and the science of reading, what it says, and the components of early literacy. We needed to understand all of that, not only the measurement of those essential skills, but truly understanding the research. But with accurate, without the accurate data, so I keep going back to the data piece, it's nearly impossible to improve reading outcomes. We were spinning our wheels at our school. We had hardworking teachers. We had the variety of assessments. And, but we had like an ad hoc approach to intervention. We were trying this, we were trying that. I'm sure you, you can relate. It's, it, it was frustrating because we were working so hard at the wrong things. So learning more about the research, it led us to selecting a universal screening and progress monitoring assessment that was valid and reliable and efficient in assessing the skills that every child must master to become a proficient reader. And for us, it was a cadence reading. And I want to share with you the Acadians reading. This is at the actual data from our first grade, the entire first grade, 106 students. And names have been changed, but we were facing overwhelming odds. As you can see, and I put up the entire grade level just to show you one slide. It's a sea of red and yellow, which indicates at risk of reading failure. And actually it's 74% of our first graders were at risk of reading failure. We thought, okay, we have a big problem. We could clearly see that we were not meeting the needs of the students. So with that data at the top, reading the Acadians data, it, it showed the colors, but it also measured the specific essential early literacy components. 
And this chart represents those uh, components. On the left, we have phonemic awareness, vocabulary and oral language, phonics, oral reading fluency, reading comprehension, and the definitions beside them. This was, this was laid out with a research from the National Reading Panel in 2000. But what I love about Acadians is that it measured each of those components so we could tell, are we meeting the needs of the students here or not? So beginning with phonemic awareness, it measured with first sound fluency and phoneme segmentation fluency. Were these kids able to, to um, hear the sounds and um, take words apart and understand and, and start matching the sounds to letters? And then it, we had the phonics portion. The Acadians measured the correct letter sounds the whole words read and oral reading fluency, which is ORF. And this piece right here is where we spent most of our time, I tell you, um, along with phoneme segmentation fluency. But man, looking at the correct letter sounds, how are the kids beginning to blend and the whole words read? We had a lot of work to do in this area because we needed to create accurate decoding to create that oral reading fluency. This was pivotal. And that oral reading fluency is measured by the oral reading fluency score. And there were um, three passages timed with one minute. And um, the research behind Acadians is 40 years. It was profound what we were able to see with our oral reading fluency measures. And there's a note that research shows for grades three through six that the correlation between oral reading fluency and reading comprehension is very strong. And then we, we come to reading comprehension as measured by that oral reading fluency. As I said, it's a very strong correlation to reflecting reading comprehension and the maze measure. And then lastly, we have the Acadians is an indicator. It's an indirect measure of um, vocabulary and oral language by the scores on ORF and MAZE. So this is where we began our hard work, but that wasn't enough. We had our universal screener and we could tell, okay, now we've got all these kids that are not at benchmark. And when you have 74% of your first graders, it's like, okay, we, we are sinking. So we brought in a diagnostic assessment for students who scored below or well below benchmark on Acadians. And for us, we selected the 95% group diagnostic, the phonic screening inventory. And this was a game changer for us because we had so much work to do. With this diagnostic, we were able to identify the lowest skill deficit of each learner. Was it our control valve? Was it a vowel team? What was tripping them up? And this led right into instruction. And the beautiful thing uh, and why we selected 95 was they had materials and processes to match those lowest skill deficits. So we didn't have to hunt and peck. It was all there. And then we learned more about the research and the science of reading tenants through the ongoing professional development and coaching, as Stephanie mentioned, was an important component. But this, um, the diagnostic help us group students in light groups according to their lowest skill deficits. It helped us know when to move students to the next lowest skill deficit, they were ready or not. And um, it just, created a solid tier two in intervention, but we also found that using that diagnostic information, we brought it into core because our struggling readers were our struggling readers and they needed extra support in those skills they were struggling with. And we opened up our doors and we had a walk to learn and we had small group instruction but we used our Acadians data and our diagnostic to refine that instruction and meet the needs of our students. It's about matching the, the instructional needs of our students. It eliminated the guessing and it really made a solid 
tier one, tier two, and tier three. That's it. That's the heart of MTSS is that match between what students need and the instruction that you're providing all across their day, starting in tier one. So we're going to zoom out a little bit and just do some clarification about the kinds of assessments that you need to have in place to really implement a school improvement approach like MTSS. There are four questions that you're asking when you're building a multi-tiered system of support. And assessment tools are designed and created to respond to specific questions. So I'm just gonna describe a little bit about each of these assessment questions or purposes, types of assessment, there are four of them, and Sharon's going to describe what they used in their uh, school. So uh, first of all, universal screening answers the questions which students are at risk and which systems are at risk. As I said earlier, many schools have gotten good about doing universal screening to find individual students who are at risk. We need to take that next step to ask about the percentage of students who are at risk and what that says about the effectiveness of our classroom reading instruction. In order to do universal screening three times a year, you're going to want to look for screening tools that are brief, that have some evidence of actually being able to be collected uh, reliably so that each time you give it, you would get the same uh, performance from your students, that they are valid measures, of those five essential early literacy skills, you want to find universal screening tools that are indicators of those essential early literacy skills. It's not necessary to measure every grade level standard when you're doing screening, that would be an achievement test or an outcome measure. For screening, you want brief indicators, which skill within the broad category like phonemic awareness, is the best one to tell you if a student owns that category of skills. And maybe most importantly, you wanna find universal screening tools that are predictive of future reading performance. Sharon has talked about the uh, outcome measure in California at the time, the CASP assessment in third grade and above. That's one important reading outcome in the future that your screening assessment could be uh, measuring or predicting. So those are some characteristics of universal screening. You could think about what you're currently using or if you're in the process of selecting one that might give you some quality indicators to look for. In terms of diagnostic assessment, this is a different assessment purpose. It's a different assessment question. You will need different tools for diagnostic assessment. Everything I said to describe universal screening does not apply to diagnostic assessment. These are two different purposes with different characteristics. So diagnostic assessments are in-depth. They are designed to tell you exactly what should you teach next. For individual students who are identified as being at risk on a universal screener, you're going to want to go deeper into that skill area to find out exactly what does the student already know and what's the next thing to teach. So that's going to be an in-depth, more time-consuming assessment. It's not necessarily something that you do with everyone, so it's not universal in the way that screening is. And diagnostic assessment is not something that you necessarily have to repeat over time. Once you've pinpointed where a student is for example, on a scope and sequence, you have that information and that's where you start instruction and you can move forward uh, from that, that place. So the most important characteristic of diagnostic tools is that they actually inform instruction. They should be very closely related to instruction, if not directly related, as in a placement test that comes with an instructional or intervention program. Those work really nicely as diagnostics. And because students can have difficulty in all five of those essential early literacy skill areas, you'll need diagnostic assessments in all five of those areas. So universal screening tells you 
which systems and students are at risk. Diagnostic assessment tells you exactly what to teach tomorrow. The third category or purpose of assessment in MTSS is progress monitoring. These tools need to be designed to answer the formative assessment question, is instruction working? In real time, is my instruction getting the benefit that we want for students? Is it causing them to make sufficient progress or should I make a change to my instruction? So progress monitoring is a feedback loop to the instructor telling you if you should keep teaching what and how you're teaching or you should make a change. So progress monitoring assessments um, have a lot of overlap with universal screening. There are several tools that can be used for both purposes, screening and progress monitoring. So they are brief, usually one minute activities that are indicators of those five essential early literacy skills. They need to be able to pick up on and capture learning in very small increments of time. So uh, weekly or daily uh, learning needs to be captured in progress monitoring, very sensitive to change in small increments so that you can actually use them to inform changes to your instruction. Uh, progress monitoring tools should have alternate forms, perhaps alternate forms of the very same tasks that you use for universal screening. That's a very efficient approach to a school-wide assessment system because then you don't have to have training on uh, you know, three or four different tools. You can use the same tool for screening and progress monitoring. And then the fourth category or purpose of assessment is outcome evaluation. This is summative assessment at the middle of end of middle or end of year, looking back to see if your instruction worked. This is the category most teachers are most familiar with. It's achievement testing, it's state accountability testing uh, that, that is um, looking back to see if your students have met those grade level standards. Okay, so Sharon, you wanna talk about the tools that you used in your system for each of these? Yeah, well, as I mentioned, we began um, selecting and we selected a universal screener. For us, it was Acadians K through six. This was the aha, like, oh my goodness, first grade, 74% not on track. This is, how can we change this? You know, it's like, we, we have a big problem. Okay, so then we um, had to equip ourselves with a good diagnostic assessment to drill down further, like, because our, our instruction wasn't hitting the mark and the diagnostic help reveal the exact next step of what to teach. Like I mentioned, is it our control valve, valve team? What, what is happening with the students? And the diagnostic assessment really helped drive that instruction and it created it. The intervention was key because it was aligned to what exactly what the students needed and um, then we, we went from there. And then as we taught and changed our instruction according to our universal screener and our diagnostic assessment, well, I'll back up to the diagnostic assessment. We, we had the materials and processes to match those lowest skill deficits. With 95, it was easy because they designed the materials and processes to match that. So it was something that we could easily supplement our core curriculum with, and um, it helped us fix the reading problem. But we had to progress monitor, and it took me a while because it's 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 honestly daunting. At first, we just had the universal screener beginning, middle, and end of the year, and we had the diagnostic. But it wasn't until I really paid attention and implemented the progress monitoring system using Acadiance reading. It was usually every two weeks, but sometimes every week. It was driven by the data. For some first graders, kindergartners, second graders, we really needed weekly progress monitoring, that discrete responsiveness to instruction. Because we found with, with first grade especially, we needed to create boot camps after lunch. I, I needed to find money in my budget to time card our paras to regroup kids. And um, 
and intensify that instruction after lunch. They needed added practice. They needed more time with um, the materials that would help them become proficient readers. So that progress monitoring is key because it told me along the way, I didn't have to wait. It was middle of the year to the end of the year. And then I missed that. We missed that learning opportunity. I, I loved the mid-year data because we knew, okay, we, we've got all this work to do yet. We, we've got a lot of the year left to change our instruction. Let's do it. And, and it became pretty exciting because our progress monitoring would show, okay, we're, we are on the right track. They're responding. This is good. And for those that aren't, we had to go back to the drawing board and re regroup and, and that necess necessitated a more focused instruction. And then lastly was our outcome evaluation. And for California, it's the CASP, the SBAC. And at first it was, you know, really hard to take the, that data and, and wrestle with it because it was very telling that we were working hard, but we weren't meeting the needs of the kids. But it was also very affirming because after we refined and, and put the MTSS process in and we, we were on our game, then it began, it, the cast began to reflect, yes, these kids are reading accurately, fluently with comprehension. We worked on the writing. And so it was reflected in the cast. So that was very affirming. Next is we had to really, with these assessments, we had to roll up our sleeves and come together. And when I say come together, it's not classroom by classroom. It's by grade level. It's the principal. It was me included, the grade level, the literacy team, any specialists. We had to work together and we, it's kind of messy at first. We had to gather information. We, got, we, had our, we had our data. We had to learn about the science of reading. We had to have um, coaching and ongoing support. And we also sought out advice from experts. And I was lucky enough, thank goodness, to have a relationship with Dr. Stoller. Um, she was my initial Acadian trainer was Dibble's next at the time, but um, she came to our district and we we just struck up a friendship and I was able to call her or email her and she would respond to my questions because I was just, I didn't know and I was learning. And not only that, but I found that Dr. Roland Good was responsive. There were some larger issues that happened on my campus and I could go directly to him and say, hey, what about this? And um, he was so responsive and supportive. He was co-founder of Acadians Reading. And then there's also Dr. Susan Hall, who's the co-founder and creator of 95% Group. And she would be responsive and help with questions and conversations. So I felt very fortunate, but they knew, these experts knew we were working so hard. We, we were putting together the right pieces and they wanted us to succeed. And um, I, I just find in the educational world that people are very supportive and helpful. And I'm very, very thankful for that. But also we learned, well, if you could go back, Stephanie, just one, but we learned about um, how to analyze that data through ongoing professional development about Acadians and about our diagnostic assessment. We um, worked as grade level teams and we set goals. And the thing about Acadians, it has its criterion reference with their benchmark goals. So we knew where kids should be at beginning, mid and end of the year. And um, it informed our instruction and we gathered that data and research. And we strategized about the personnel as a school, as grade levels, as teams, we strategized, what do we do? I had to look at the budget, free up money to fix the main problem. It's the main thing. Other things were periphery. And I quickly let go of things that weren't helping us solve the reading crisis at our school. And it freed up that funding to ma maximize our instructional literacy blocks, hire extra paraprofessional professionals when needed. And it, and all of this to say, it helped us create that collective teacher efficacy that has so, is so important on campus. Go ahead. 
So we put all this into a, a collaborative problem solving um, process, what I just described. And if you remember that short list that Stephanie shared of why students aren't getting the instructional match they need, the lack of professional learning, the schedule, the personnel, the diagnostic data, the materials to match the instructional need. This process helped work it all out. This is the nucleus. This is where the science of reading research and impactful instruction lives and breathes. We begin with, well, you begin with a universal screener because it, it identifies which students and systems are at risk, as Stephanie mentioned. We, we identified the problem where our instruction was off, you know, and then we went to the diagnostic. Well, exactly what should we teach next? That diagnostic help us. Why, why was it occurring? Because our, our core curriculum wasn't sufficient in this area. And then we had to make a plan and match the students' needs to instruction. And then progress monitoring uh, was needed along the way. So critical. It, it measured the response of the students to the instruction in real time. Is it really working? And we were able to adjust accordingly. And we revisited this cycle all the time. And it was clearing up the schedule, hiring subs. You know, it's a heavy lift on the administrator's part, but that's our job. We, our job is to remove the barriers, to pave the way, to help all of this happen. And so I just absolutely adore the collaborative problem solving process. So <clears throat> next I, I see that there are schools that I work with or people I talk to, well, we only have 60 or 90 minutes for ELA. We can't fit it all in. Well, I tell you, that's not enough time, especially in a school like ours. And I don't know if your school is like ours or not, but our instructional, our ELA instructional block was 150 minutes. That's including a tier two intervention block of time. But the data drove that schedule. It wasn't the district. I had to, I had to uh, um, lengthen our instructional block because the needs of the students were dictating that. And it's not a question of how do we fit it all in. It's a question of how does everything else fit around it? Because it, again, it's clarifying. It's the main thing. The biggest gift we can give students in life is reading proficiently proficiently. That's our job. So how do we find the time? You know, it's it's imperative that the instructional minutes of the EL, ELA block are guided and informed by the data. As I said, we had to lengthen our instructional ELA time. Then we had to, <clears throat> I had to look at the bell schedule, change the lunches, change the recesses. We had to accommodate the ELA instructional blocks of time. And then Look at the specialist schedule. If it was special ed, if it was music, art, PE, whatever it was, they received our schedule at Loudoun and they worked around those blocks. Nothing interfered with our protected time. The most important work we do during the day and that's teaching kids how to read. So I wanna give you an example of our MTSS schedule. It's very bright. But on the left are the grade levels, TK through sixth grade. At the top are the instructional minutes. But just taking a step back and looking at those bright pink blocks, that's the lunch times. The blue, those are our recess times. And the white, that's homeroom. That's when all the kids are with their own teacher, uh, <clears throat> homeroom time. But I wanna draw your attention to the green blocks. And that's to highlight that a portion, during a portion of the ELA time, we um, had a walk to learn. We opened up our doors. Again, we analyzed data by grade levels. We used all our manpower. We flooded the grade levels with paras and we used every teacher at that grade level to create small group instruction. The kids walk to learn for their needs. And um, 
it worked out well because it wasn't only, if we'll go back, it wasn't only the um, um, kids that were struggling, but the benchmark and enrichment kids, their, their needs were met as well because they were reading proficiently and we could take them above and beyond. Then the orange block, it depicts the 30 minutes of um, <clears throat> um, intervention and it happened, by the way, this is every day. Nothing interrupted our instruction, no assemblies. I didn't care what it was. Very few times did we not have our walk to learn schedule and we protected it at all costs. That's how you improve reading outcomes. You have to protect that. There were no interruptions during this instructional time and I communicated with parents, please don't take out your kids during these orange and green blocks. This is this is where we're meeting the really using all our resources to meet the needs of the students. And um, with that being said, this schedule helped put us on our way to improve reading outcomes. Go ahead. So this graphic was in, in many of our classrooms. Work stores up before it shows up. And I love this iceberg analogy. Because boy, it's not it's not immediate, but it's a journey. And I knew like the end of the year outcome, the end of the year achievement test. Well, it's not magically gonna get better in one year. It takes a lot to heavy lift TK through sixth grade to improve those reading outcomes. So we had to be persistent. We were met with failures. It was messy. We didn't always know what we were doing. And we had to have those organic conversations daily and, and look at the data and refine that instruction. And it's okay to fail. We had to sacrifice times. I had to, I had to um, really revise the budget to hire subs to give that planning time for our grade levels. They, were, they needed that extra time to plan as a grade level, to, to create that collective teacher efficacy so we could have equitable instruction throughout, they knew what they were doing together to meet the needs of the students at their grade level. We had to, to um, just be disciplined and dedicated and do the hard work. And it's not all seen until, you know, the end of the year CASP, in four short years, we could see that, but it's just all that to be said, it's staying the course and it will, your success will happen. So again, I just revisit the the case the cast data um, from going from our first year from twenty one meeting and exceeding the standards to nearly sixty percent um, meeting and needing the standards. This was huge. We were no longer the school at the bottom. In fact. This, this is really profound. We were the fourth highest from the top of our district. We went from the bottom and we're the only non-Title I school to be competing with our four higher schools. So it was, it was very affirming to us. So this next slide, I just have to share with everybody. Um, this is depicting and showing our sixth grade students. Okay. 2019 was the last year of CASP data before what happened, COVID. But our systems and structures were in place in 2020. So mid-year assessment for Acadians, that's the last time we could assess because in March, COVID hit and we didn't have an end of the year assessment with, with the data. But this showed right here, that yellow arrow, 93% of our sixth graders could read accurately and fluently. And that was profound. It made me cry. I was in my office. I walked around the library and the, I just, I, I said, oh my gosh, this is amazing. It was that consistency of the systems and structures that those kids that started in kindergarten and working their way through 93% could read accurately and fluently with comprehension. It was the gift for life. They had a chance in junior high to thrive, a chance in high school not to become a dropout and have access to opportunity, 
go to college. It's just data is amazing. So next, I wanted to share with you, it's, it's, it's a lot of hard work, but it's the best work in your entire life when you can improve reading outcomes at a school site or a district. This book, I know there's all kinds of educational books and all kinds of research, and, and I, I read a lot, but boy, this one really helped me. I read it two, maybe three times. Jim Collins, Good to Great. It's about companies and CEOs, but his core concepts are right on. Great leadership to, is service, service to a car, cause, a purpose bigger than we are. What purpose in life as educators is bigger than creating proficient, proficient readers, giving them the gift of opportunity? It's about systems. He's a big systems leader. And that's our job, the multi-tiered system of support that Stephanie so eloquently laid out. We are big systems leader for, for us to fix the reading problem. He also describes the BHAGs, the big, hairy, audacious goals. This is wonderful. And the, and the, and the barriers you might come up against. And then he, he leaves you with, will you do whatever it takes? And that just hit me. I thought, yeah. We have to do whatever it takes. Our kids' lives are at stake. This, this will affect them for the rest of their life. So I just had to share that resource with you. And then next, we have the Wallace Foundation. This is how important principles are and how they affect schools. An effective principal's impact is stronger and broader than previously thought making it difficult to envision a higher return on investment in K-12 education than the cultivation of high quality school leadership, according to the research synthesis. Wow, just wow. And the reading gains from replacing below average principal with an above average one would be larger than approximately 50% of the effects of, on reading achievement of various educational interventions in 747 studies. Pretty profound. So to sum all this up, kind of put it in a little bit of a recipe form or just synthesize this information. At our school, we began addressing the foundation with our universal screener. We had to find out who was on track and who wasn't on track for reading. We had that diagnostic assessment and that would give us the, what to teach next, supported by those wonderful materials and um, practices with ongoing professional learning, learning about the science of reading. We supported with school-wide block schedule, additional personnel, materials and processes to address the foundation reading, foundational reading deficits, and we implemented the RTI-MTSS specifically for reading. We constructed a solid core foundation. We shored it up. We differentiated at the core with small group instruction, meeting the needs of the students. We unpacked those common core standards again and again, because once we started creating proficient readers, it was, it was much better and much easier to um, teach to those standards. And then we um, utilized what the state of California gave us with the CASP assessments, the IAB assessments. We wanted our kids not to be afraid of that assessment, but to equip them with how to navigate it and what to do. All the while we're fixing the reading problem but a lot of our kids didn't have computers at home. And we had to utilize the tools before the um, end of the year assessment came about. And then it's all about that systematic instruction, small group instruction, but also layering in that writing. We addressed the writing all along. We had a common writing practice from kindergarten through sixth grade, and that was truly beneficial. So I don't ever present or um, talk with people without referring to this quote 
because it really hits home with me. Every system is perfectly designed to get the results it gets by W. Edward Stimmings. And when we first began this process, I saw this quote and I did not like it. I didn't want to, I, I didn't like it at all because we, we were not doing well. But on our journey, as we began to improve and our outcome evaluation, that end of year assessment showed, okay, we are, we're, we're aligning our systems and creating readers. Then I began to embrace that. And I just know that we can get reading right. We must, because our kids' lives are at stake. Well said, Sharon. Uh, we have a few resources that we're sharing with folks, some of the things that were mentioned in our presentation and some places where you can go to dive deeper into the topics. And then uh, we're sharing our contact information in case we don't get to your question uh, today during the session, you can feel free to reach out to us.